afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Building the Black Educator Pipeline Podcast. I am your host, Shana Terrell. Welcome back to all my co-conspirators and to my new ones watching this week. I just want you all to know that we love you and we appreciate the support. And as always, shout out to Citizens Ed and the Center for Black Educator Development for having this platform where we can talk to real people in the real struggle doing the real work. And of course, I want to shout out the South Bronx that raised me in Philadelphia that made me. So this week, we'll be focusing on the benefits of educators in the classroom. Our guest today feels like every child deserves a Black teacher. So to all my folks out here watching, do you agree with that? Do you believe that every child deserves a Black teacher? And if so, why? Please comment in the chat. So my guest today, Dr. Misha Mosley, the founder and director of the Black Teacher Pipeline. Dr. Mosley has dedicated her career to helping students reach their full creative potential, creative and academic potential. A teacher, analyst, and product of public school education, she designs custom reform strategies that help educators and administrators increase equity while maximizing school performance. Mosley brings a wealth of classroom experience to her work, infusing bold strategies with real-world approaches that understand the burdens faced by educators and administrators. She's an expert on leadership, cultural competence, database inquiry, and school design. Mosley began her career as a social studies department head of Third Grade Marshall Academic High School in San Francisco, California, and received her PhD in education with an emphasis on social and cultural studies from the University of California, Berkeley. So welcome all the way from the West Coast, Dr. Mosley. <laughs> yay, yay. That's yes, good. You know how we do. <laughs> yes. I'm about to say we want a video because I would have had you just crip walk in. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, no. Jokes. <laughs> but right, welcome. Right, right, right. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank we you so are, much for having me. Yes, we are super excited to have you. And we're super excited today to talk to you definitely about your efforts with the Black Teacher Project um, and what's going on in Cali. Um, so first, I want to start out, always start out with talking to my guests about, talk to us about your journey in education and why you decided to become an educator. Well, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, shout out to Flatbush in the in the 1980s, which meant uh, uh, for my particular journey, it started being bused to white schools um, because as crack hit the streets in Flatbush, our local schools, my mother was like, mm, I need you in one of these gifted and talented programs. So took some tests, got bused to white schools. And that's an important piece because subconsciously I was taught that white was right these were where the better schools were. Mm -hmm. And when I went to high school, I took a test. I ended up going to Brooklyn Tech, which was a specialized high school. And that was really my first experience with black academic excellence. At the time I went to Brooklyn Tech, it was 35, 30, 33% black, 33% Asian, and like 33% a mix of everyone else. And because it was a selective high school, everybody was deemed smart, right? And so to be surrounded by black people, and this is Fort Greene, Brooklyn, when like Do the Right Thing came out, Spike Lee shop was across the street from my high school. So you can kind of picture the, the black cultural moment of the late eighties and early nineties. Mm -hmm. That's when I was coming of age and that's when I was in education. So I mentioned that because that I've seen the spectrum. I went to a predominantly white college, but that high school experience made me want to be an educator, made me want to be a teacher because I wanted children to feel what I felt. Because it was a big school, we had tons of activities. I had teachers who believed in me and I was surrounded by people who looked like me and who were different from me. And we were all just like getting it. So fast forward to me moving to California to teach. Um, and as you mentioned in my bio, my first year teaching, I was department chair at Thurgood Marshall Academic High School, which was at the time a new high school. It's public, but you know they, you know how cities like revamp things. And mm -hmm. so fresh coat of paint, new name, boom. And I appreciated that leadership experience, but I also was trying to figure out how to do this teaching thing. And I had strong relationships with students, but so many of my colleagues, particularly my, my non-Black colleagues, had trouble connecting to Black students. 
And so I and so I would often be tapped, like, you seem to have good relationships. What's your magic? What are you doing? And I'm like, it's not magic, I, you know. But over time, I felt myself really being frustrated by the lack of professional development to address those racial disparities. And I'm not gonna say racial disparities in student achievement. I'm gonna say racial disparities in teacher skill and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so I ran off to grad school, went to UC Berkeley, go Bears, um, to get my PhD because I was like, oh, once I become Dr. Mosley, everybody gonna listen to me, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it. Racism is racism, whether you got a doctor in front of your name or not. That's right. What I will say is I have opportunities like this to say things that I would have said before grad school, um, but doing the research, like having some documentation to back up what I'm saying makes has made the difference. Mm. Um, so fast forward again to 2014, I'm engaged in professional development and I run into a former student from Thurgood Marshall, Belinda Bellinger, who's like, what's up Ms. Mosley? And I'm like, why are you calling me Ms. Mosley? And it's all grown folks. <laughs> and she is now grown up to become a teacher. When I taught her in 10th grade, she was not a strong student, but she knew I loved her and believed in her. And so we had developed a rapport, but lost touch. And she was now thinking about quitting teaching because she was like, mm, I don't know if, if it's for me, I really want to like talk about real issues and have students, she's an English teacher, really learn and read books that connect to them. And I don't feel like I can do that in, in, you know, in education. And I had written my dissertation about black teachers navigating multiracial spaces and just like what 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 needs to happen when i reconnected with belinda i basically was like i now need to dedicate my life to supporting black teachers and staying in the classroom and transforming schools so mm -hmm. what happened to me doesn't happen to her or any other black teachers and i think that for many of us who had experiences in white schools you can become successful in an inequitable system and that can confuse you if you don't know who you are and what you're there to do. Because then it's like, let me just make sure that these black babies do what I did to be able to quote unquote, make it. Nobody talks about the thousands of dollars in therapy we spend trying to undo the harm that education has done to those of us who are quote, successful in the system. So I uh, can you, that's deep, right? Like, especially that point. Can't, can't, no, that is um, because I talked to many folks. Um, one of them being my older sister who is an educator, she's a principal who talks about her mm. experience in private school mm -hmm. um, and then moving from private school to also going to a PWI and what that yes. did to her identity mm -hmm. and the struggle to like figure out who you're supposed to be in the world. Right. Can you unpack that a little bit for folks who mm -hmm. like were went to school with predominantly black or Hispanic folks? I didn't really mm -hmm. experience white. Even though I went to a PWI, my experience was completely mm -hmm. black. Um, I didn't experience <laughs> it was like, I'm going to surround myself with my, we're going to have a good time through these four years. I know um, that's right. <laughs> but I didn't experience what you would consider whiteness or an explosion of whiteness mm -hmm. or surrounded by whiteness in the world until mm -hmm. I got into a workplace that was uh, right. predominantly white. Um, so can you unpack yeah. that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, so let's, if we go back to even the, the, the history of education, right? So I was a history teacher, so I, I think it's very important that whatever field you're in, you understand the history of it. Too often, we just kind of start with the latest. But school, public school, as we understand it, was designed to divide us into owners, managers, and workers, regardless of race. Because, you know, public school, as we know it, was, you know, it was illegal for black folks to even learn how to read. Learn how to so read. when you understand that trajectory of how we as black people even came into education, you have to appreciate the richness of all black schools. Now, when we think about um, the history of HBCU, so many of those land grant schools, it's a really complex situation. So many of those were about training people to be agricultural workers. That's why there's so many agricultural, mechanical HBCUs, right? Mm -hmm. Over time, we're like, yeah, we could do lots of other stuff, right? But for many people, being a teacher was the was a, a, a main professional path. Cut to Brown versus the Board of Ed. Over 30,000 Black teachers are just fired, period. Los and the only Black teachers yeah. that are able to stay had master's, master's degrees, had formerly been administrators, most of them. And now they're you know, regulated to to 
teaching in circumstances that don't allow them to shine. I'll put it that way. And so from the beginning, for those of us who are alive today, our frame of so-called integrated schools is that white is right. Mm -hmm. Right. So not only is a teaching force predominantly white women, people say that all the time. When you look at leadership, there's a lot of white men. Right. So people talk about the white women, but I'm like, check your principals and superintendents, like check those demographics. Yes. Right. Check, check Somehow the, there's not a lot of men exactly. across race. The men get to be in leadership positions. That's another podcast for another time. But Thanks. I say all that to say the PWI experience, a predominantly white institution experience, then structurally and culturally, the, the sheer numbers create more opportunities for siloed. I won't even say segregation and I won't even say in many cases, affinity, but a siloed experience for people of color. Mm -hmm. And so how you navigate a campus, how you talk to a teacher or a professor about your learning is skewed by just the sheer numbers of a dominant culture, in this case, white people, and the, and the way school is set up. So the mm -hmm. individualism that we see in schools versus the collective mm -hmm. learning that yep. many yep. people of mm -hmm. color come from, you get individual grades, you get um, individual assignments. If you're working together, it's cheating, right? So all of these, these, these subconscious pieces get into your head. And so even the way I, I was prepared to speak, I'm talking to you now and now at 48 years old, I speak the way I speak. I don't, I don't think of it as code switching. I just think of it as like, what I feel like saying, how do I feel like saying it in this moment? But for much of my life, I knew, I knew why I was department chair at Thurgood Marshall. It was all men in my department. I was a woman. I spoke a certain way. At the time, my hair looked different. I, you know, I, you know, I did the interview with the clutch pearls. So, you know, I might have done a little bait and switch on the principal. I came with the pearls, and then I showed up to school with the braids. And he like, is that all right? What? Who, who are you? I was like, bro, I was trying to get this job though, right? You know so, and, and, but the identity development, the experience of for many of us coming out as black, if you've been in these predominantly white institutions for so long, depending on what's going on at home, you've got to understand your lane of blackness mm -hmm. because the media will tell you there's one way to be black. And if you're not that way, if you, you know, all those tropes about, oh, you, you talk white, you're trying to act white, right? Who your friends are, all of those things impact your educational experience. And when you're in PWIs, I graduated with John Andrew Morrison, Nicole, and one other brother in my undergrad. The fact that I can name the three black, yeah. so I can't even name, right? So it, if we all hung out, that, that, but we didn't. We all kind of went our different ways. And so it took some time to really understand my, my black culture and what I want for young people is however you identify racially, that you get to experience the fullness of the diversity of that group. Mm -hmm. There's no one way to be black. We in the Black Teacher Project, we're real clear about that. Yes. You you, you need to do more than show up as black, but there's more than one way to be black. Yes. So the Black Teacher Project, can you talk to us a little bit about what that actually is? Because that's I think it's amazing what you're doing. Um, and just like us at the Center for Black Educator Development, there's a lot of folks mm -hmm. who watch the podcast. There's a lot of synergy um, in building this mm -hmm. work to develop and recruit um, Black teachers. Can you talk to us a little bit about mm -hmm. what y'all do over at the Black Teacher Project? Right. So our work has evolved over time. You know, um, when we first started, we were about recruiting, developing, sustaining Black teachers, right? That was our, that was our jam. Like, how do we get people in? How do we support folks um, really uh, through healing and leadership to sustain themselves? About a year and a half ago, we were like, mm, I don't know if we can, I don't know if we need people sustained in this nonsense, right? Mm. And so we shifted our mission to really be about supporting teachers to reimagine schools as places of liberated learning. And so the sustainability is about sustaining you in the fight to change schools. And we make a distinction between retention and sustainability because with retention, people just are being held. You're just holding on, right? But you're not necessarily thriving. And we know that there are a lot of black folks that are just holding on. Yes, We're not healthy, we're not happy. This is not what our ancestors died for. This is not what they fought for. 
And so if anyone's out there stressed out, burnt out, consider your ancestors who gave their lives so that we could be free. And it is our responsibility to move as close to our liberation every single day as possible. And so I'm not saying like, sit on the couch and veg out and don't do anything. I'm saying as we are fighting to make this world a better place, let's do it from a stance of freedom. Let's do it from a place of power. So what we do in the Black Teacher Project is really help Black teachers understand how have you been impacted by oppression? Don't think because you got your credential or you got your degrees that you weren't harmed. You could have gone to all Black schools, HBCU, the whole shebang, you were still harmed because we're sitting inside an ecosystem that is designed to destroy us. Mm -hmm. And so if we can understand that and understand how it's impacted us, we can start to heal from that while, because it's not a linear process. There's an ongoing process of healing while you're doing this reimagining work, while you're doing this transformation work. So too often teachers feel like I gotta go get my administrative credential and be a principal so I can create change. I'm like, you got babies in front of you right now. And I, I use that story of Belinda because when we parted ways when she was in high school, she didn't end up graduating from that high school. Mm. I was not successful with her there, but what she remembered was that I loved her and I kept telling her that I thought she was brilliant and intelligent and I kept pushing her. I was like, I need you to do this homework. I need you to do this thing. And though in that moment it didn't work out, I believe that our ancestors reunited us because we had more powerful work to do. What was it? Probably, you know, 10, 12 years later. So really understanding that when we're talking about liberated learning, for many of us, we won't be alive to see the fruits of our labor, but that does not mean that we are not doing that reimagining, that we are not really trying to test out what does it mean to. I'm, I'm thinking about what some of our teachers have done in our professional development. One teacher is teaching grammar and she's like, right. So instead of them you know, reading some random paragraph to do their grammar correction on, I've got students reading culturally relevant items and we're still correcting grammar. It is still a grammar lesson, but subconsciously they're learning about black history. They're learning about Latinx, Asian history while they're correcting grammar. Yeah. So that reimagining of what's possible is really so much of what we're up to. And I, I think that there's like really some distinct points that kind of cross each other that's important for people mm -hmm. like to really lift up when you're talking about the work that you're doing. So mm -hmm. what being in America in itself or being these Americanized schools do to you and have you thinking mm -hmm. this in this very individualistic way instead of collective and communal, but that mm -hmm. drive your, your level of thinking and your level of what you think success is. So like a lot of things of what you pointed right. out, is like me feeling like, oh, I got to go get my administrative degree or I have to be a principal. Still, mm -hmm. you have to climb these ladders of leadership in order to have impact and be successful. When we know every great revolutionary movement is really started um, from the collective people on the ground, uh, you know, who, who lift that up. Um, so I think that that's mm -hmm. definitely important when you're talking about people mm -hmm. understanding their place or this notion of like, I've arrived, like I've made it, like I have my degree. Right. And I this right. So, like, this is the only way that you can like arrive and make it and mm -hmm. not understanding even as black folks, our own privilege in that type of right. thinking. I um, mean, thinking in that, yes. that type of way. Um, I think that's, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you speak of healing practices, but I don't know if people really understand what that, what mm -hmm. that, Right. When you talk about like, right. Healing, a lot of people talk about, think about, right. Cause I know for me, I associate with healing with like healing from a sickness or even when you talk about mental mm -hmm. health or like, mm, I got to go see a therapist to be healed. Nobody mm -hmm. thinks about healing in a sense of teacher training and professional development. Yes. Um, that's yes. a super in yes. innovative way of thinking about how we're going to train our mm -hmm. teachers. Like we have to do healing practices. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about mm -hmm. some of the strategies that you actually connect to a, to a healing mm -hmm. practice? for to teach right. professional development. Well, first let me let me um, connect to what you were saying in terms of like what are we healing from? So first you got to understand that part, right? So we talk about broadly self and community care as professional practice. You must if you are a professional, if you are educational professional, you must be engaged in self and community care. And so part of that care is that healing from oppression. We start with the premise 
that this is an inequitable system. The system of education that is currently in play is inequitable. And when there is inequity, there is harm. So understanding how we have been harmed by the educational system in my lifetime, right? I think about two, two black women, Gloria Latson Billings and Kimberly Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. You take culturally relevant teaching and intersectionality. People are throwing around these terms now in 2021, like they've always been there, like they know what they mean. <laughs> they don't, right? But if we just use that to talk about healing, Kimberly Crenshaw, intersectionality is not simply the multiplicity of identities. It is how those identities come together to create a particular kind of oppression and harm. Yes. So understanding that, so let's just take the identities of being black and being an educator. How those identities come together to create a particular kind of harm, because we are in a position to be what I called in my dissertation, saviors and scapegoats. Mm -hmm. So the black teachers that are around people, when people say, oh, we need more black teachers, usually we're around, quote unquote, to police black bodies, right? Yes. And so, and to bring black teacher magic and save the black children. Our <laughs> black children don't need saving. Our black teacher our children don't need to be fixed, right? Nope. But this idea that if we can do it, we're the saviors, right? Yes. Now, if you're in a situation where black children are still being harmed, then often non-black people, and again, I say non-black because I'm not just talking about white, but non-black folks might say, well, if so-and-so can't do it, what do you want me to do? Now they're now we're the scapegoats. Those two positions create a particular kind of harm for us where we can't actually just teach, just thrive, just connect with black and non-black children. And so understanding, as we talked about before, our own educational development, how did you make it here? How many black teachers can't pass these exams? Mm -hmm. Which if you know the history of those exams are setups, they're, they're rooted in the eugenicist movement. They're all kinds of bad, right? And across race, people will say that the tests that teachers have to take don't have anything to do with their skill as a teacher. But for many black teachers, not being able to pass those tests mess with your mind. So now you've got that internalized inferiority while you're standing in front of students. So let a non-black yes. student challenge you. Now you're triggered. Some of the workshops we, we offer about navigating triggers in the workplace. Cause now you going back and forth because somebody may have asked you a question about and it just is taking you to another place. So mm -hmm. understanding how all of that is impact, that's what we're healing from. Cause mm -hmm. I can't actually teach you if your question, if I feel insecure, if I can't say, I don't know, right? If I can't say, let me find out. My job as a teacher is to guide your learning, not to know everything, right? So when we understand how, what we're healing from, we can connect it to our professional practice and say, in order for me to develop as an educator, I've got to heal from going to schools that didn't prepare me for what I'm doing now, from the racist expectations of me, I'm just going to fix racism, racism in this school. Hey, <laughs> guess what? Racism existed before me, it's going to be around after me. My job as a Black teacher is not to fix racism. My job as a Black teacher also is not to police Black bodies. That's so right. the fact that I may have a good relationship with black students and they hang out in my room at lunch doesn't mean I'm now in charge of discipline. How many black men become administrators through the lens of becoming deans? How many black men are on the operation side and not on the instruction side? All of that gets into our psyche and creates opportunities where we need to be healed in order to be fully self-expressed and thrive. And it's not like just individual, I wanna feel good. It's because we have things to offer that can transform this school system. But if you got us caught up in this nonsense where we're beat down and can't actually tap into our own gifts, we're harmed, the system's harmed, and unfortunately, and more importantly, the That's youth and families that we're serving harm. are That's harmed. Right. That is that is 100% fact. And also, you believe that every child deserves a black teacher, right? So the reason why Absolutely. I want to like definitely lift this up and harp on this, right? So a lot of folks in this movement are doing the work to recruit or have more black teachers. We are trying to find mm -hmm. desperately more black teachers for more black children, right? Because we know mm -hmm. that nationally, the number is only 7% of the teaching force mm -hmm. are people of color. So we're not even just talking about black. 7% mm -hmm. are people of color. Mm -hmm. And then you have 15% of the nation's students in public schools um, who are children of color. So huge disparity. Mm -hmm. So folks is like, child, we're just trying to find black teachers to at least be in front of <laughs> black kids. Um, but you are here. Right. Every child deserves a black teacher. 
which I don't necessarily agree with, but I would love to hear some of your mm -hmm. thoughts on the benefits mm -hmm. of every child deserving a black yeah. teacher. Why yeah. that's so important to not just have black teachers just in front of black children. Why it's important mm -hmm. for folks that are non-black to also experience mm -hmm. a black teacher. Absolutely. So think about the construction of school, at least as we have it now. Teacher is the one in charge, right? The teacher has the, the, the teacher is a, the authority figure in the classroom. The leader. For yeah. non-Black children, because we live in such a segregated society, many non-Black children don't actually have a real relationship with a Black adult. Yep. They have images on television and in media, but they don't have a, a real, right? And when you think about school age children, we're, they're developing into adults. Mm -hmm. And so having a caring adult, we want all kids to have a caring adult in their lives so that they will grow up to be caring people, right? Mm -hmm. But when we think about a black teacher, to be a black teacher, there is expertise, there is knowledge that you hold that the students in your class don't. They depend on you to guide their learning. And so it's not just having, for example, a black babysitter who can love you, who can nurture you, but may or may not, depending on your age, have that authority or have that respect of, of knowing more. And so when we talk about black teachers for non-black students, it allows them to have a black adult in a caring and authoritative position, not really authoritative in terms of oppressive, but like in terms of a leader, and a leader, to look up to, a leader you right? Up your entire life in a in an all white, predominantly white world, and you never see black people in leadership. In your mind, it's not possible. And then you again internalize right. that black people have some type of deficit because you've never seen a black person lead. You've never seen a black person exactly. be educated. You've never seen a black person in leadership. Exactly. Um, I'm close. I'm making decisions, no. right? Exactly. In the fairy tale and, and, world, maybe of TV, right? But Right. Never in right. your immediate and, vicinity have you experienced that. Whereas black children experience and, and white people making decisions for them the entire lives. Exactly. And it's, you know, there's a piece around having that black teacher actually also get to know you and care. And like, you know, for for teachers, there is a a a a particular relationship that happens with students that is different, right? And so to have a black teacher in your sphere who knows you, who knows your family. I will also name, like, as we think about what happens with folks who are coming into this country and this culture from other places, they are immediately taught Black is at the bottom, particularly Black yes. Americans who've been in this country for multiple generations at the bottom. Yes. And so they're not smart. They're not, So you have folks always just trying to jockey, just don't let me be, you know, I, I recently finished Isabella Wilkerson's cast. And while she doesn't talk specifically about racism, this concept of caste relative to race, you kind of see like, don't let me be the lowest. Yes. So I also want to, you know, when I say every child, I'm not even just talking about white kids. kids yeah. When I look, I'm here in Oakland, our black brown divide in many cities did not always exist in this way. When you look at in this city, the Black Panthers and the Brown Berets and the coalition building that happened in the 60s and 70s has been systematically destroyed within the field of education the split between special education and English language learners relative to funding, relative to how people organize, that is intentional. And that yep. is about intentional divisions. And so when you think about what it means to have black teachers teaching a myriad of students, those young people get to experience blackness up close and personal. And those teachers also get to be in many cases in lifelong relationships with folks. So for me, that, that tagline is about racial justice. It is about reimagining a future where we get to love who we are, but not be limited and siloed in terms of who we interact with and that we can love across difference. My, I mentioned Brooklyn Tech because those demographics that I shared, like the things that we were doing in the, in the late eighties and early nineties in terms of cultural sharing, between black, brown, and white folks was powerful. And so because I experienced it up close and personal, I'm like, I know it's possible. I know what it's like for folks to share cultures, not just on a particular day. And when you see more diverse cities where young people can actually interact, you start to see, like California is one of the places where you have more cross-racial 
relationships and marriages than in a lot of other places. And that is because folks are building those authentic relationships at a young age. Yet, Oakland's still black. We're not getting rid of blackness. You know what I'm right. People somehow think if we, when we start talking to what's going to, no, 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 no. We can have it all. Let's, let's expand our thinking where we can both come across difference, come across racial difference and still hold on to who we are. Because I can't actually come across to you if I don't know who I am, which is why we do our work in racial affinity. Know who you are. So when you come to the table with non-Black folks, you're not engaged in their version of your Blackness. You have your you own know, sense of Blackness. You know, you know who you are. And I love that you right. said like sharing cultures beyond a day. Um, Cause again, I don't think that people realize <laughs> when you have these cultural awareness day at the school or international festival day, and like, we're going to celebrate someone's exactly. culture, like for the day. Um, and I understand mm -hmm. what it really means to live in a society where we should be cross-cultural and understand and support and affirm each other um, in being mm -hmm. and just living. Um, but yep. in doing that, it doesn't strip who you are. It doesn't strip your right. culture, your identity, right. or your pride. Um, right. Because again, living well, in a white supremacist society. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, part of white dominant culture yep. includes um, dichotomous thinking, either yep. or. And so when we move to diunital thinking, which is a both and, right, we start to see more possibility. I can both be steeped in my own culture Right. And it's not like there's one black culture. So let's deal with that part. Yeah, you know, not I mean? just in black not racial affinity. Several times on this, show, this is we, black people are not monolithic. We are not. We are not. No one is. Right. So we got a mm -hmm. lot going on there. But I can both be steeped in my culture, the multiplicities of my culture and both and still connect with you authentically across racial difference. But what happens and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the PWIs, when I don't know who I am. I am defined by others. And in order to be successful in whatever environment I'm in, I may lean into their definition and understanding of who I am. So you have black people performing whiteness and internalizing those performances because there isn't a strong foundation of what they're, they're again, there's no one way to be black. And in the black teacher project, all kinds of folks are like, well, I identify as this, can I come, can I come? you know, to the meeting, I know it's racial affair. I'm like, la, 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 la. When people say Black Lives Matter, you think they talk about you? Then you can come. <laughs> if you got questions as to whether or not that's talking about you, we not worry. Maybe. Right? And, th and then I also say, you know, there's, when I, when I say you have to do more than show up as Black, it is about centering a Black experience for us in the Black Teacher Project. You know, people will say, I'm a teacher who happens to be Black. Okay. You, in that language, you're centering teaching and you've got blackness kind of happen. I happen to be right. Right. And so for, for us, it's a, it is that diunital. It is both. And it is the intersection of the black teacher identity. That's what we're playing with because a black, my best friend is a physician. She's doing very similar work in pediatrics. Okay. And so and it's ironic that we've been best friends since kindergarten. And we looked at each other a couple of years ago. And we're like, how on earth did we both end up here? Yeah. But it's because <laughs> we both went to predominantly white schools. We both knew at a young age, she wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a teacher. And as we got in the system, we're like, that's nonsense right here. It's crazy. I can't just teach. She's like, I can't just heal the babies. I have to actually transform that for the next generation, what this field what this is. is. Because you, both so of you- So that's what we're doing. Yeah, both of you are in professions that are like racially oppressive. So needing to- And necessary. <laughs> like healing, like you need to go to the doctor and you need to go to school. You can't- I mean, what year, it. it could be the 1800s, the 2020s. I'm gonna you, need to go to both. You can't escape either one of those. So definitely inserting healing practices for people who don't have a choice but to survive within these professions um, or are of service or in service mm -hmm. professions. I think that's super important. And you talked about affinity groups. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that definitely in sustaining, because I think that you made a good, really good point earlier about retention. Right. Like we ain't mm -hmm. just trying to hold on to people. We ain't want people just hold it on and hanging on by this thread. We are trying to make it a sustainable yes. profession where your own soul mm -hmm. is sustained. You feel like you are 
not burnt out and being able to provide quality work to children. So I think sustainability is mm-hmm. a much better word um, than retention. I like how you frank that. Um, but I know that affinity groups are an important part of sustainability. Um, can you talk mm-hmm. about the work that the Black Teacher Project does in terms of affinity groups and why that's mm-hmm. so important to establish that? Um, and I want to make one more distinction because mm-hmm. when we talk about affinity groups, people now sometimes think about affinity um, in terms of race, but affinity mm-hmm. groups expand way beyond that. That's 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 yes. What we say, what we like to remind folks is that we are already organized in affinity. Affinity groups have been in existence since the beginning of schools. We are in affinity by age. We are in affinity in some cases by gender. We've been in affinity by subject matter. So affinity is not new. When we talk about racial affinity, that's when people get, you know, they get twitchy, they get twitchy, (laughs) right? And so we like to just one normalize affinity. Why would we? Why do we have things called high schools? Why do we feel like we need to separate teenagers and their learning from other? Right? Because there's an affinity. There's something about folks who have around the same age or around. Why do we have science departments? Because there's something about bringing scientists together to talk about how you're going to teach. So we already understand the value of affinity. Let's talk about what we need to do in racial affinity. And I know that after last summer, when people found out about racism, because you know that just hit the that just hit the the streets. Like that just like hot off the presses. There's racism in the United States. Are we racist? Well, hello, we're not even gonna get into it. Some some people still feel like you know we're not racist, but that's a whole nother listen. I'm (laughs) drinking water and not my calming tea. So let's just (laughs) don't get my blood pressure up. I gotta get my right. But, you know, people want to jump to affinity groups as a solution to for racism, right? Like, just like when people call and say, hey, can, we need more Black teachers. Can you get us some Black teachers? And I'm like, for what? What you, what you want Black teachers for? For what? Oh, to police Black bodies? Because somebody called you out? Oh, that's what you want? You don't want Black teachers to actually teach you something about how to transform education? We can't help you, Right. So similarly with affinity groups, people just think like, oh, we just need a space to be together. What we have learned at the Black Teacher Project is how you curate those affinity groups. Please hear me clearly. How you curate people coming together in affinity is everything. It is everything. Simply creating the space is not enough. You must shape the space. It's like saying, oh, we just need a classroom full of kids. Do you not curate the classroom? Do you not think about your lessons? Do you not think about the physical environment, whether it's on Zoom or in person or right. you know on video or in person? So just this idea of taking care to understand what is the purpose. I have seen affinity groups turn into vent sessions and folks who would otherwise want to come get disengaged because who wants to show up and listen to people complain for an hour? Mm-hmm. Or it's a call to action and people are so busy trying to act and change things but they're acting from a place of hurt. So at the Black Teacher Project, all of our racial affinity, first of all, our professional development is for Black teachers by Black teachers. That is the core of what we're up to. And so one, we want Black teachers to be able to see other Black folks in leadership who are focused on their development. Their development for us is always rooted in three primary things, Black love, healing and leadership Mm. because we believe we must start from a place of love and start from a place of love of our own blackness and us as a black community. When we think about healing, as we talked earlier, we've got to understand how we've been harmed, not only by this country in, in general, but by the very system that we've chosen to be a part of. We are now agents of a system that is destroying black lives. That's some stuff. That is some You can't just roll up and do your job every day unless you have a space to actually make sense of what is mine to do given that this is the position I'm in. Yes. It's not just let me get all the babies to do what I did to be quote unquote successful. Cause quiet as it's kept, you got your own pain points. Mm-hmm. And so that third piece of leadership for us is you do, again, you don't need to be in positional leadership. This is, this is part of the mindset shift. 
if we're waiting for the sanctions of other people to make us department chair and put me on the instructional leadership, man, you may never put me in a positional leadership role. But when you roll up in a school, I always ask people, who do you think runs the school? You think it's a principal? <laughs> you need to holler at the secretary and the janitor. The secretaries and the janitors run these buildings, mm -hmm. right? And anybody who's been in a school building for a while knows they know. Don't get on either either their bad side. So when we think about lead, they are leading. You think about the coaches, all of the folks who have not been in teachers of record. They are leading and supporting black and brown children in very particular ways. When we are talking about leadership, we talk about leading from the classroom. Mm -hmm. It is our hope and vision that black teachers will stay in the classroom for at least 10 years. Now in 2021, that's a tall order. Mm -hmm. So we say, it may not be full time, you might be an administrator, but we want you to hold on to one or two classes. If you're in elementary, we want you to co-teach and have your own class that gets to see you teaching, not just as an administrator, but teaching. So when you are leading a building, you're not going off of what you did 20 years ago, you actually understand the experience as a teacher. So we believe in a, the, an expansive notion of what leadership can be and what black teaching can be. So that racial affinity work, part of why we do that in racial affinity is whiteness is all around us. And I don't mean white people, I mean whiteness. whiteness. And so yeah, having totally a space where we can you know, and I even, I talk about being black centered even more than Afrocentric because I think for me, how Afrocentrism has been codified is just so steeped in patriarchy. It makes it difficult for us to actually talk about the diversity of blackness, mm -hmm. right? Like how do we talk about black queer folks, black trans folks? How do we talk about mixed race black folks? Like really have an expansive notion of how blackness shows up and how when we have blackness at the center in the 21st century, it's gonna mean something different than it did in the 19th and 20th century. Yes. So our affinity groups allow for that, that fullness. And I think that's amazing. And I think that, again, the way in which you're thinking about it in such an expansive way, it allows for, that, for those healings to take place, for understanding and people being able to ground themselves and understanding who they are and their place in the world. I think that that's super, super important um, versus we getting together as an affinity group just to complain about whiteness, right? Like, no, we getting together in this group to heal from the trauma of whiteness, but then to that place part. ourselves in a space to be mm -hmm. able to do the work. Um, and I think that exactly. that is super important. The other point that I just want to highlight, clap and lift up is this notion that even though you are a leader, you should be in the classroom. And not attached. So yes, attached to like, you have to know what's going on. You have to be in the know, but also attached to the impact that that has on children, uh, especially in terms of a shortage, right? Like, and we don't have enough mm -hmm. black teachers you, as an administrator is one less person, mm -hmm. one less black person in front of these children, black, white, or mm -hmm. whatever. So you holding on and being an influence um, and having those deep connected relationships, as you said, the teacher to student relationship is so different. It's so special. Yeah. So even though you are teaching and you are leading, being in a space or in that very intimate space with children is super, mm -hmm. super important. Um, mm -hmm. So through your work, and, what is, go ahead. No, I just want to say, um, because I know we're talking about pipeline work and too often we, we are thinking about this moment and forgive me if you're going to ask this later on, but it's just on my, on my heart right now and in my mind. By being in the classroom, when people talk about the shortage, right? Yep. It, it's it, it it's it's true, but there's also, and this is part of my spiritual practice of appreciating the abundance, right? Like we have enough food to feed everybody in this country. We have enough beds to house everybody. We are ab abundant. So when we talk about scarcity, that has to do with how we've organized the abundance. Mother Earth gave us everything we need, but we over here being reckless for centuries, <laughs> right? Fair. So yes. we're like, oh, we don't have enough. I was like, really? You saw what happened with these vaccines. Oh, all of a sudden, quickly, when we want to like find a cure for something, we can round up and do it. I was like, by the million, you know, for me. free. For free. I was like, y'all, you know, we're playing ourselves. But let me, again, another podcast, another time. But in terms of the being in front of young people, if we think about education's not going anywhere. So it is not just about how do we find teachers right now. 
But how are we in front of a fifth grader inspiring them to say, when I grow up, I wanna be a teacher. So one of the things we do in the Black Teacher Project is we pay our teachers, right? We pay folks to engage in ongoing professional development. Why? One of the main reasons why people don't wanna be teachers is that there's no money in it. Kids aren't stupid. They're like, right. so, for the, especially for the children who are growing up in poverty, they're like, so you want me to get cursed out on a regular basis and be broke? How about no? <laughs> How about no? So we have to show them a different image of Black right. teachers. This is a branding thing. So our affinity work allows us to love up on each other and get the, the, the fullness that we need to then go back in front of folks and be inspirational and say, I want to be like that teacher yeah, when yeah, I grow yeah, up. Yeah. So I just wanted to just like give a nod to the pipeline. Be it's a long game. It's a long just like racism is a long yeah. game. So is this transformation work. So we have to be okay with may not see it in my lifetime, but I'm on, I'm I'm doing my part right now. Yeah, it's definitely a long run game. It's definitely a long run game. And exactly what you're saying, I always say like. It's our job in building this pipeline to inspire young people to aspire, right? To want to be. Mm, love that. Like we inspire yes. so that they can aspire because we're not mm -hmm. going to have a pipeline. We're not going to have a pool of folks to actually build from or choose from if we're not inspiring yet young people to aspire to be teachers. They, right. they won't be and, so, and there are a lot of young people who are inspired to work with youth. So they'll go into after school. They'll become a coach. They're like, oh yeah, you know, I love my younger cousins. I want, but I'm not going to go in the classroom because I see what y'all are dealing with. That yeah. is why our leadership pillar around transforming the system from the classroom, right? It's super it's so important. important. Yes. Because if folks aren't, if you're just like being successful in this current nonsense, you are perpetuating the nonsense. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say people have to show up to the Black Teacher Project. You have to show up with more, you can't, it's not just about being black. You have to have a frame. All of the folks who are involved in BTP have a frame around transformation, a frame around reimagining. And if that's not your get down, that's cool. There's 50 bazillion other black organizations that you that can get involved with. But as for, as for us, this we're trying to change the game. And we if need folks who are like- And reimagining, cause that's, that's the only way we're gonna change the system. If you ain't down with that, you can go ahead and you know fine tune your fine tune your skills um, somewhere else. But we really trying to impact exactly and make change you here. Got it. Like you said, it's a long run game. I should be able to mm -hmm. ten to fifteen years from now see the students that I've taught that I was in front of and say like that's why I became a teacher. Look at this revolution that's happening right now. Yeah, that's why I tell the story about Belinda. I mean, literally, I wrote my dissertation in two thousand three about black teachers. I reconnected with Belinda in two thousand fourteen. My dissertation was sitting on a shelf for 11 years. You know, my mama like flipped through it, but nobody read that, right? It's just there. <laughs> when I reconnected with Belinda, I went back to it to create the foundation of BTP for her. She's still in the classroom. She's finishing her ninth year, right? She's like, I don't know about next year. I was like, Belinda. Come on, shout out to Belinda. She's you the one, because she's the one who came up with 10 years. I didn't come up with 10 years. She came up she with, came 10, with years. 10 years. I was like, B, I'm gonna need you to Hit play. the goal, sis. Hit the goal, sis. Come but, on. <laughs> but, but what we get in that is a personalization to understand. So like, for example, in our programming, we didn't have childcare in our programming, but then Belinda had a baby. And she's like, well, I wanna come, come on. And I was like, bet, let's get with the local parent organization and find out what, at, what babysitters would work in our black affinity space. Boom, all of a sudden we have babysitters at our, so that kind of like, you have to be responsive to the people you're trying to serve, just like we yeah. would with students. Those of us who are serving teachers, what is it that y'all need? So that paying folks is folks are like, I got to leave or I got to go leave to be an administrator and make more money. But if we're paying you to engage in this professional development and improve your practice, that puts a different. So I'm like, pay black people. No more free black labor. Yes, pay black people. The, thing about the, the, the money is there. The recruiting black people, right? So removing financial barriers is one. But then you're also hinting on something that's major. And I used to speak about with children, but it's also important for educators serving people holistically. Stop trying to serve a piece or a part, right? So stop right. feeling like I'm just teaching you math and that's all I need to do for your success. No, there's a whole person, there's a whole human in that classroom. Exactly. And you're responsible for servicing the whole person holistically. As you say, mm -hmm. being responsive to the needs, but also not feeling like that's something that you have to do alone. 
It's a collective effort. So people aren't getting burned out or people aren't using the phrase like, I'm not a social worker, you're not, but we are a community and we are responsible right. uh, for one right. another. And we need to be taking care of each other and supporting each other in a holistic mm -hmm. way. Um, and and I'll, I'll just say even like being on this podcast and connecting with you all, part of what, and I'm so happy that as I've connected with other organizations that support black educators, we've from jump been collaboration, not competition. Because yeah. that whole, I got to, you know, especially those of us who are organized in nonprofit, like you're trying to get grant money. That is, and I, I never, <laughs> now I'm like, all power to the people. I was like, that's the system. <laughs> but it <laughs> is like this scarcity model, right? But we know when we work together, there are, no, the, the Black Panthers are not as successful as they are if they're not working with the Brown Berets. Martin and Malcolm, there's a whole story that, you know, again, this history teacher in me is like, Harry, we talk about those, in the, we talk about Harry Tubman. Harry Tubman didn't do all that by, I mean, you know she didn't do it by herself. There mm -hmm. was a whole, this idea of the whole Underground Railroad. So this idea of us working collaboratively and collectively cannot be underestimated, even when we think about supporting Black educators. So we're really excited. You know, there's a Black Teacher Project, but there's also the Center for Black Educator Development. There's a Black Teacher Collaborative. Like there's so many organizations that are engaged in this work and as we understand, hey, this is our niche. What's your niche? Okay, how do we come together? How do we connect and build power? Out. If you are pipeline. at all confused, this is about building power. So we want the pipeline yeah. so that when folks step in, they're stepping into building power. This is not just about having numbers to look cute. This is about transforming our society. So Hello. I just wanted that, that piece around coalition and connecting it's just so, I'm just so happy to be on this podcast with y'all. Like, and, and we happy yeah. we left you, sis, because that's an <laughs> excellent point. The coalition of building mm -hmm. power, right? Like in order to do that, you mm -hmm. have to have coalitions. Again, being America right. sometimes blinds you to this notion of like everything is individual success, but mm -hmm. no, organized as, as a people, having collective power, mm -hmm. that's super important. Um, And mm -hmm. I also want to talk about I think that's very reflective of the time that we're in right now. Like we agree, right? Like this is a mm -hmm. historical moment, right? Absolutely, with, absolutely. With being a historical moment, like what would you consider? Like why, right? Some people don't understand why this is a historical mm -hmm. moment. And I know you do. Can mm -hmm. you expound on like why yeah. is this a historical moment for us? And why is this important for black people? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna, I see that Sister Peoples has got like a, a question around, um, non-traditional educators, this is me being like trying to do a lot. So I'm gonna just combine yeah, those two. Yeah, this yeah. historical moment, this historical moment for like, people talk about learning loss right now. And I'm like, the babies have learned so much this year. They mm -hmm. learned that we don't care about elders. We don't care about youth. We don't care about folks who don't fit into these boxes of performing, you know, of, of productivity. We have to understand our value beyond our labor. If we're just teaching kids to work, right? Which is do your homework, do your class. We're just your your grades, your value is about your labor. Yes. Do you remember with black people? That's not a good look for us, where our value is about our labor. Hello. So we have to de you know what I'm saying? I'm like, listen to what you're saying. Do the work. Work, work. And I'm like, these babies, some sometimes it's just about being. And I think non-traditional educators who are not inside of the classroom have helped shape this historical moment. So yes. when you think about the movement for black lives, when you think about BYP 100 in Chicago, like these, these young folks, younger folks, right? Um, who have been leading these social and political movements are educators. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, uh, after school folks, you've got folks in community-based organizations who are educating young people. So for those of us who have chosen to be inside of the system, Part of our work it has to do with making those connections, not just having a guest speaker, but bringing real life. I got to co-teach government with one of our fellows this year, and it was an election year. The fall happened, and I was like, Rayvon, you're the only one that that's in the fellowship that's teaching 12th grade government. Girl, I need. Can, let me get in on this. Is we on Zoom? Can I get it? Because how how can we not just take the ballot as text? And then we're gonna teach about the three branches. We're gonna teach about all the things okay. that are in the standards, but through the actual what's happening in real life. So then we talk, we, we had videos 
from local community organizers talking about, so again, those outside of the classroom, non-traditional educators, really bringing in you know, an Asian American sister to talk about the organizing that's happening in East Oakland relative to the ballot. That's not in the textbook from Florida and Texas. Right. They, ain't, they ain't got that stuff. They don't know nothing about East right. Oakland. That's so that's right. not gonna be in the textbook. But I tell you one thing, those babies learned about some government this year. So for us really as human beings being engaged outside of schools mm -hmm. allows us to, to see everything that's in front of us. There's somebody else in our um, Black Teacher Design Lab. Um, these folks, uh, are they in the Bronx? They are in the Bronx or Maryland. Those are very two different places, but I can't remember. Maybe even Philly. <laughs> what but listen, what, there were like 50 people in the thing. I can't remember. Where, but these are two science teachers and they were talking, part of what they came up with was talking about the trajectory of rubber bullets at mm -hmm. protests and, and how far you are from the police shooting rubber bullets and what that means for the impact. So they did a little bit of the history, but just this idea, so young people are protesting, there's probably gonna be protesting this summer. So their physics lesson is ripped from the headlines in terms of gun control, in terms of policing, but we're gonna learn. And so when they talked about it, this was, again, we're putting healing at the center, but they're talking about not only the physical healing, but just the for, for young people, the trauma of gun violence, the trauma of going to express yourself and the fear of, well, it's a rubber bullet, so it shouldn't hurt. Like to take all of that and put it in a science class. Mm -hmm. This is what our black teachers are doing. So this is why I'm like, and oh, they're hitting the common core. Don't talk to me about common core. We, we, <laughs> that's its own thing, but we got you there, right? Yes. But what we're gonna do is hit those common core standards through something that is outside of the classroom, in this historical moment, but is also going to engage young people in learning right. because right. so many of us were trained in the 20th century before the internet. And I'll say for me, the idea that we still hold on to teacher as keeper of knowledge is such a like outdated, 15, 16, outdated, 17, right? These babies, these babies are looking up on their, they're like, uh, miss, that's not accurate. Look, that's, that's what the thing said, that's not, right? Yes. So we are not just banking that that whole, like giving you not, you we not are curating and are we're curating the talking. curiosity, right? Like we're, yes. we're trying to get you in. And so anyway, so, so I just wanted to use those examples of both the, the historical moment that we're in around centering blackness, yes. not just like, oh, we've been oppressed, stop the oppression, but centering practice, centering blackness for our collective liberation. That's right. When black people, and I would say black women are free, we all gonna be free. Yes. Because if you look at any movement, that's what we're up to. So this historical moment, and again, it won't last. Sometimes we get in our feelings, right? Trayvon happened, we had a whole bunch, Mike Brown, we had a whole bunch of stuff. Then 2020, and we're like, oh. I was like, but you know Trayvon was 24, like, it was, that was years ago we were telling you about this. Forget yes. about the city, like just a couple years ago. So we there is a both keep your foot on the gas pedal and the historian in me says, have that larger perspective where we understand our ancestors who were on plantations were dreaming where we could be on a podcast having a conversation about this. So what are we dreaming of for future well, generations? Generation. Girl, no, that's right. We are winding down on time. So as always, I just want to give you... Oh. Um, <laughs> this is this is what happens when we out here. Building. You know, I get to talk it. <laughs> yes. Um, I always give folks an opportunity to say anything. Final, one last final word. Um, before I close out the show, mm -hmm. so you have the floor yes. right now. Thank you. So I want to say, um, this work that we're talking about is inside out work, and so really having an opportunity to reflect on your own experience so that you can move forward powerfully is so important and move forward collectively. Get your rest, get your healing on, and get your community on. Do it together, both in Black racial affinity and across racial difference. That is going to be key to our collective liberation. I know that's right. So, Misha, I want to thank you so much for coming today. This has been an awesome thank discussion. You. And thank you and shout out to all my co-conspirators who have been watching. Please make sure you like. Please make sure you share. Please make sure that you comment. Um, and today's discussion was most definitely most important and pivotal.
Shout out to all our funders out there that are investing in this work. And please remember, when this historical moment is over, that does not mean that liberation has come. So continue to invest in this work. Continue to invest in freedom. Continue to choose to do the right thing. As always, thank you for joining us this week on Building the Black Educator Pipeline. I see you same time next Thursday. Thanks for watching.